Today I wanted to talk about the 12 things that you must always check for when buying a used piano, and to some extent a new piano as well. So let's get started with number one. The first thing to check for when buying a piano is to make sure that it's in tune. And this might not sound like a major issue because tuning a piano is really a rather simple fix. And sometimes if I come across a piano in my videos that happens to be out of tune, I really don't make any mention of it because it is a simple fix. But however, believe it or not, a detuned piano can really hide lots of errors and just bad uh, qualities that the piano might have. It can hide voicing errors, it can hide sustain issues, it can hide lots of weird little tonality issues and all kinds of things that are undesirable in a piano. And we actually have a story that affected us because of a piano that was out of tune. We went to buy a piano that uh, we wanted to purchase for a student and it happened to be out of tune but it was by a reputable manufacturer and we had dealt with this model in the past before. So we purchase this piano and take it home and tune it up and we realize that it's actually an absolutely horrible piano and that we can't give it to the student. And so it's really important to when you're looking at a piano to make sure it's in tune because as I said, if a note has too short of a sustain in the treble or there's major voicing errors, sometimes the uh, a piano being out of tune can actually hide those and it sounds weird but it is true. Number two on our list is the bridge. Now for those of you who are not familiar with the anatomy of a piano, the bridge is this part that runs right along here and it basically separates the non-speaking part of the string from the speaking part of the string because this is the part that vibrates and makes the sound and this is the other end of it that does not make any sound. And so you always want to look at the bridge, particularly in older pianos, but even in new pianos as well. Uh, I've, I haven't heard that it's a terrible issue with newer pianos, but it's always safe to check. And you look at the bridge, particularly here in this area that's kind of painted black, and you look for cracks in the bridge. And basically, typically the cracks will be running essentially perpendicular to the pins, I mean to the strings, or parallel with the uh, bridge pins here, and they'll just be small little lines that can really run anywhere. Sometimes they might even be parallel with the strings. I haven't seen that, but I think it's possible. And you just want to check for these cracks, because what can happen is the cracks will actually make the little bridge pin move, and it can make the string do weird things, and it's really not a good thing to have. Now, now typically um, it's the older bald ones like the SF10s and sometimes I believe the SD10s as well that will have bridge issues uh, because of the way they made their bridge and this is a Steinway and I've never really heard of any recent Steinways having bridge issues but as I said it's always a good idea to just double check and make sure that your piano does not have bridge cracks. Another thing is typically they're up here in the treble bridge which is this area here, this section and this section is where I see cracks most often. I haven't usually seen bridge cracks in the rest of the bridge down here because this one piece extends all the way down here and there's also a bass bridge that is on the copper wound bass string bass strings and I haven't really seen cracks down there but once again it's always a good idea to check number three on our list is the soundboard now I'm standing here with a flashlight because the best way to check for cracks in the soundboard is with a flashlight. You could also use the cell phone on your phone, but this is a very bright flashlight and it works very well for the job. Now checking for cracks in the soundboard is actually very easy. What you want to do is have somebody go underneath the piano where it's dark and then have someone else, most likely you, take a flashlight and um, hold it close to the soundboard like this over the strings and then pan back and forth covering every inch of the soundboard while the person underneath is looking for light shining through in a little strip that would indicate that there is a crack. Now the reason that cracks in soundboards are um, important and you don't want to have them is because they can completely alter the overall sound of the piano and also if the crack is only small and the wood pieces are vibrating together they can cause really annoying buzzes. Number four on our list is the hammers. Now right now we're down here at the base end of the piano as you can see by the copper wound strings and we're looking at the base side of the hammers. Now what you want to look for when you look at a piano's hammers is you want to look for a number of different things in fact. You want to look at uh, how worn out the hammers are and how deep the grooves are worn into the piano. Now since we're down here at the base end which doesn't get played as much as the middle of the piano, the grooves aren't as deep as they would be in the middle of the piano but you still want to check all over the piano for how deep the grooves are because that can indicate the quality and the condition of the hammers. Another thing you want to check for is just overall shape of the hammers. You want to make sure that in general there is a lot of felt left on the hammers and that the shape of the hammers is not abnormal, that there's not chunks missing out of them, or that the hammers aren't butterflying, which is when one of the staples actually comes loose and then the hammer just kind of separates and it is very strange. You want to make sure that usually happens in older pianos. You want to make sure that's not happening. There's a number of different things to check for when looking at the hammers. Now I mentioned that generally the hammers have a lot 
lot of felt on them, and that's because at the very end of the piano, like C8, the last octave or so, there isn't very much um, felt on the hammers to begin with, simply because that's just how the pianos are designed. But for generally the rest of the uh, hammers, you want to make sure that there's a lot of felt on them and that they are um, shaped correctly. Number five on our list is the strings. Now, once again, we're looking here at the bass strings because the bass strings are honestly the most important um, strings to look at when you're looking at a piano, and they're also the first ones to fail. Now, what happens in grand pianos and also uprights as well is that if the lid gets left open all the time, dust will collect and accumulate on the piano overall and also the bass strings. And when you look at an older piano, you'll see that the bass strings have kind of like a brown, gross, dirty look. And a lot of the times when you see pianos that look like that, the bass bass will not be as good as if the strings were new. Now, generally strings would be replaced every 20 years or so, but interestingly enough, the piano we're looking at here is 20 years old, and that is because the lid has been left down for basically the piano's entire life, and as you can see, the strings look basically like brand new. So when you get a piano, especially if you're getting a new piano, and particularly if you're getting a really high-end piano like a Steinway or a Fazioli, leave the lid down unless you're going to be playing the piano or showing it off to friends when they come over, because you really want to make your piano last as long as possible, especially if you're paying as much money for a high-end piano like that. The other part of the strings that I wanted to touch on is the steel strings that are over here for the rest of the piano. The bass side strings are steel wound in copper and the rest of the strings are simply steel. Now as you can see on the right hand side of the screen there, the strings are very shiny and they're giving off a really nice reflection when we hold a light to them. Now a lot of the times with older pianos, I've seen that the strings have corrosion or rust on them, which is not something that you want to have and it's something you want to look out for when you're looking at a piano. Number six is the tuning pins. Now when you look at the tuning pins on an older piano, you'll often notice that they don't have this beautiful uh, silvery shiny look anymore. They have a darker kind of like a not quite black but a more like a dark bluish look to them. And that is honestly pretty normal for older pianos, but this, uh, I guess it's tarnishing or it's not really corrosion, I guess it's just a tarnishing and a patina. That look can be prevented by once again having the lid closed all the time. This is the same piano that we were just looking at with the wonderful strings and as you can see the tuning pins even though the piano is 20 years old they still look almost brand new you could probably take a cloth and just kind of wipe them down and make them look even shinier already and we just want to look at the tuning pins and make sure they're not rusted or anything like that because if they're really rusted you might not even be able to remove them because the rust might have eaten away so much of the metal it might have changed the shape or something that would be a really really bad case but rust or corrosion on the tuning pins once again is not something you want to have number seven on our list is the finish now the finish of a piano is really completely cosmetic and depending on the kind of person you are, if you want a really pretty piano to just put in your home and look really nice and maybe play from time to time, you'd want to inspect the finish particularly carefully and make sure there's nothing major on it. If you're looking for a fun project and you want to completely refinish the piano, well the case wouldn't be all that important to you. But if the case is important to you and you want the piano to look really nice in your home, I'm going to point out some of the things you'd want to check for, um, little spots that you might forget uh, to look at and then you might get the piano home and go, oh I forgot to look there. There's a mark there. Now, one important part to look for um, scratches and dents and whatnot on a piano is the lid, because the lid's going to be up, and when you're looking at a piano, you're going to be looking at it from the other side generally and looking at it from the keys. You're not going to be over here, and this is the side of a piano that if they're going to put it up against the wall, they'd be most likely inclined to put this side up against the wall if it's in a home or in a dealer. Some dealers put the piano uh, with the other side against the wall if they're all in a row, but that's um, a different story. So you'd want to check the spine of the piano and make sure that the piano hasn't had any bad moves and then it's hidden by a wall or something like that or another piano. Check the top of the lid because once again, you might not be looking at the top of the lid and look for marks and dents and stuff like that. And another thing you want to check for is underneath here because this part is always supposed to be folded over like it is now on a piano. But a lot of the times when the lid is closed and this part is folded over and it's making the piano close, people will put potted plants up here, which sounds like a nice idea, but the pots will leak and then the water will get on here. Even if you have one of those little trays that collects the water, water will still get on here and it will make a ring and mess up the finish, and especially if it's a wood tone finish, but even something like this, it would put stains. So you'd want to check underneath here for uh, rings like that and stuff. So just wanted to let you know of certain parts you can look at on the piano that might have um, dents and scratches that you might miss. Number eight on our list is the keys. Now once again, the keys are mostly cosmetic, but they do have a bit of an effect on the way you play, as I'll mention in a minute. 
Now, depending on the age of a piano, sometimes they can have ivory keys, which are highly desirable in a used piano, and of course they're not sourced today. It would be wonderful if we could come up with some kind of a solution to have ivory keys or some sort of a bone material used on key tops once again, because they really have a wonderful feel. Um, they, ivory keys really affect the way you play because your, your fingers really stick to them a lot. These are plastic keys, and my fingers really slide a lot around on this, and while it's not a huge issue when I'm playing and I get totally used to it, ivory keys, your fingers just really stick to them more, and they also can help absorb sweat if your fingers are sweating or a little bit sticky when you're playing. And uh, just the natural stickiness to your fingers really helps bind to the keys, and it's just, it's a really great feel. And uh, like I said, unfortunately they're not uh, made anymore today, and today you have plastic keys. Now, plastic keys on a piano are generally always good. I can't think of a of time when I've looked at a piano and said, oh, look at those plastic keys, they're in such bad shape. But ivories, as you most likely know, the tops are much thinner, and since they kind of poke out above the key, they can chip off. And this is very common. Generally, in a good uh, condition piano, the keys might have a couple small little chips here and there. Usually, you don't see the, the, fr the uh, fronts of the keys all knocked off on a really nice piano. Sometimes you do, but... Uh, it's a bit unfortunate. Now, one thing you have to watch out for with these chips, and I didn't know this until recently, is they can actually be rather sharp. I've only seen this once, but you always want to check and make sure that the the chips on a ivory um, key are not going to be shaped like shark teeth and actually poke your finger when you play notes. I was playing a particular song that required me to jump down into this lower octave, and like I think these two notes on that piano had a really sharp poke there uh, as a chip on the key, and it really messed up the way I was able to play because every time I'd play that note, my finger would be right on the edge and it would dig into that key and it would not be good. It was shaped like a little cat's claw poking out of the side of the key and it was just really bad. So you want to look for that if, you're, if you have a piano with ivory keys you're interested in buying. Just check and make sure that none of the little chips on the keys are dangerously sharp like that. You could probably file them off and uh, just shave them down if they were sharp like that. And the chips, as I've said, are basically completely cosmetic, but a ivory keyed piano with very few or no chips is really nice to, to see. Number nine on our list is the pedals. Now, since I don't know whether you're looking at an upright piano or a grand piano, I'm going to run through everything that the three pedals can do on a piano that I know of. And uh, when you go to see the piano uh, that you're looking to buy, make sure that you know roughly what the pedals are supposed to do so you can make sure they work. Now, the right pedal on a piano is always a damper pedal. I haven't seen any example of a piano where the right pedal is not a damper pedal. So basically, the right pedal is always damper pedal. Now, what the damper pedal does is it's very simple. It raises all of the dampers up off the string so that every key on the piano can ring freely. Like that. And you can hear the sympathetic resonance of all the other strings. If it were to play any other note, they all are ringing. And basically, that's exactly what the damper pedal does. And if you press it and everything goes up, it's working as usual. Now, the middle pedal has a number of different features that I'm going to cover right now, and on different pianos it can do different things, and there's actually a wide variety of what the middle pedal does. Now, on an older piano, like from the early 1900s or before, there might not be a middle pedal, and there would simply only be two, the right and the left. So the middle pedal, as I said, can do a number of different things. On grand pianos, typically it is a, um, it's a sostenuto pedal, and what that does is when you push the pedal down, nothing will happen. But if you push a chord and then, or any set of notes, and then push the pedal down, only those notes that you had pressed down will play and sustain, but any other notes will not be sustained. And that is what the sostenuto pedal does. Uh, the middle pedal can do a variety of other things too, on cheaper grands as well as um, a lot of uprights. When you push the middle pedal down, it only raises the bass side of the dampers, which is kind of like a poor man's sostenuto, and it generally works pretty well because a lot of the times the notes you'd want to sustain would be like a low note in the bass. You push it and then that one sustains, you can do all kinds of other stuff. So it can also be a bass sustain. Or, in some upright pianos, it can also be a sostenuto pedal. This is very rare, but in some high-end pianos from the early 1900s, and I'm not sure anyone does it today, maybe a really nice upright piano from today would be a sostenuto pedal. But sometimes older um, upright pianos from the 1900s will actually be a sostenuto pedal, which is very rare, but it's possible. More often, the middle pedal is actually a practice pedal. You push it down, and it lowers a, a little strip of felt in front of the hammers, and what that does is it makes the piano play a lot 
quieter. I've demonstrated this in some of my videos before. It's a pretty cool feature and it was done a lot before uh, keyboards were invented. So if you lived in a small apartment or wanted to practice late at night and didn't want to wake the baby, you could push the pedal down and then some pianos you could even push it over to the left and lock it in place so you wouldn't have to completely hold the pedal down all the time you were practicing. It's a pretty cool feature. Now I can't think of anything else the middle pedal can do. If there's something I forgot about, you can let me know down in the comments below, but I think that's everything that the middle pedal can do. I can't think of anything at the moment. Now the left pedal is basically an una quarter pedal, and what that means is when you push it down, it moves the entire action over roughly about one string. And what that does is it makes the piano slightly quieter and it also changes the tone of the piano. It makes it a little bit warmer, and the reason for that is because when the, um, the hammers are in normal position, they always strike the strings in the same place and they kind of get a compressed section of the hammer where they're hitting the string. But if you move it over, that compressed section of the hammer is not hitting the string and now the quieter, more um, muffled section of the hammer is hitting the string. So without the uh, una quarter pedal, and with it, it's a very subtle change and in a brand new piano there will be almost no change at all because the piano hasn't been played much so there isn't really a difference between the part where the hammer normally strikes the string and where it doesn't normally strike the string. But as you play the piano you will begin to hear a difference um, when you push the pedal down and when you don't push the pedal down. Another thing you always want to make sure is, again, that the pedals are working correctly. A lot of the times in older uprights I see, you'll push a pedal down and there will be no resistance. It's not connected. And that is actually a very simple fix. There's simply inside of the piano, the bottom panel can come off because on an upright piano, there's a panel that's right here where the, uh, the back of the piano is. And then you can pull that off and inside are various rods that will go up. The pedal will push a a wooden rod that will then connect to a wooden dowel that will go up and will um, contact with the action. And generally it's a simple fix as, oh the dowel fell out, let me put that back in, and it's pretty simple to fix. But you always want to make sure that the pedal is operational and that everything is doing everything that it should be doing. Number 10 on the list is dampers. Now dampers, of course, are a very integral part of the piano because if you didn't have dampers, the piano would be an absolute muddy mess and you couldn't really play anything at all. So when you look at a piano, you always want to make sure that the dampers are in fully functioning form. As I mentioned earlier, when you push the pedal down, the right pedal, everything should go up and everything should be at the right height and everything should look normal. But, as I said, if you push the damper pedal down and nothing happens, it's probably a simple case as a dowel is missing. However, if you're playing the piano and you notice a certain note is ringing funny or it's completely sustaining even though it shouldn't, there can be a number of different things wrong with the piano. Now if we look down here at the base side of the dampers, we can see that there is the black top and also the white felt part down here. And sometimes in a piano, that white felt part can just be gone. It won't be there. This is usually in an old piano that's been around for a long time. I can't imagine that would actually get shipped out on a new piano, of course, but on an older piano, sometimes you'll see missing dampers. So if you push a note down and it does not sustain at all, like you push it and you let it go, and it just completely sustains like that, that would mean that the damper is missing. Of course, I'm holding this note down, which is why the damper is staying up, but if there was no felt there, that note would ring just like that, and you'd have to wait for it to completely decay before the sound would go away. Another thing that older piano dampers can do is they can sizzle. Now I can kind of get it to get the piano to do that if I push a note and then gently bring the note back up. And it isn't quite sizzle, but it did take longer to decay. The note should really decay like this when you bring the damper back up. It should basically immediately go out. Now the lower low bass notes, they will have a kind of a, a slow decay to them simply because of the mass of the string and it's a relatively small damper, so they won't die out immediately, so that's pretty normal. But on some older pianos, the hammer, I mean, sorry, the dampers will kind of become hard and crusty over time, so when they rest back on the strings, they'll sizzle and they'll buzz, or they might not mute the string in the completely proper way, and they will kind of ring out in a bad way, or they might mute the string slightly, but the string will ring on a little bit. So that's something you want to look for. When you're playing a piano, look for the dampers and make sure that they're all working well, because it's a very important part of the piano, and if you're playing a piece and there's one note that keeps ringing or buzzes or something like that, it can be pretty annoying. played every note on the piano and everything is working great. Now that is number 11 on our list to test every note and that's very very important. Even if you can't do a fast chromatic scale with the fancy fingering like that, just push every note. 
like that, even if you can't play the piano, it's very easy to simply push notes and make sure that everything works, all 88 keys, or even more if you're buying a certain Bose Murphy model. And basically, the reason you'd want to do this is a number of reasons. Once again, as I mentioned earlier, you'd want to make sure that every note is being dampened correctly by the strings and that no particular note has some kind of a weird buzz or something like that to it. And particularly up here in the sixth and seventh octaves of the piano, you want to make sure the note has good sustain. That's something else you want to test for. When you get to this region, particularly pay attention to the way that the note, it, when you push it, it kind of swells and it should gently gradually decay off into silence. That's the way a good piano will, um, de will, de will decay up here in the treble. A bad piano will kind of go and it'll decay really quickly. I did that artificially with the damper, but that's kind of what a bad piano would sound like. You'd push it and it probably wouldn't even be that loud. You'd push it and it would just kind of, eh, it would just fizzle out. So when you get up there, make sure the sustain is working well. And another thing you want to make sure when you're going up the piano and trying every note is that everything is in tune. Now sometimes you'll, the last few notes won't be in tune, that's a lot of the times common. But if a, one random note in the piano is way out of tune, like you play this F sharp and it's in line with this F here, it's unlikely that the tuner just missed that note, and it's more likely that the uh, oh, particular tuning pin on that note is flat. So if you push a note and it sounds really bad because one of the tuning pins is all loose or something like that, it's possible that the, one of the unisons is, is bad and one of the tuning pins is bad, and it simply can't hold the tune, and even if you tune it over and over again, it'll completely go flat. This is a rather uncommon problem, but it does happen, and it can happen. So when you're playing the piano and you notice one random note, is out of tune, you might want to check it out and kind of observe and make sure it stays in tune before you buy the piano. The final thing on the list at number 12 is the action. Now by this point in the video, if you're still around, you're probably wondering, why did you leave this for the last thing? It's one of the most important things about a piano. And while I didn't really do any of these things in a particular order, I kind of wanted to save the action for last because it is one of the most important things about a piano. It's the way you interact with the instrument. It's, it's your link to the music. And it's really important to have a really good action in order to play the piano very well. And the difficult thing about the action, though, is it's not as simple as, oh, is there a crack in the soundboard, or oh, are all the dampers in place? It's a much more finessed thing, and it's a much more subjective thing. And that's the word I'm looking for. It's a very subjective thing. Different people have different tastes, and as well as that, your tastes can change. If you had asked me a year ago what my favorite piano was based on the action, I would have said something completely different than I say now, as well as five years ago, or the year before that, or the year before that. And so my taste will change, and your taste as well will change as you grow as you musician and you grow as a pianist, and it's difficult to choose a piano that has a really good action, um, as well as um, different people's tastes. Some people really like a really light action that you, you look at it and the notes go down. Other people like a more substantial action. I kind of like both. They both have their benefits. A more substantial, heavier action can actually help you if it responds well, because as you practice on it, you'll kind of build up muscles. And then if you go out to play like a performance on a piano with a really light action, it becomes extremely easy to play that piano, where the other way around, not so much generally. But as I said, the action is a very difficult thing to look at, particularly for a novice pianist who is just getting started with a piano and hasn't had a lot of experience with playing various pianos, and they might not know what a great action would feel like or what a mediocre action would feel like. So my tip for advice for someone out there who is looking to buy a piano and wants to find one that has a good action that can last them a very long time is um, if you know a pianist who is relatively skilled or very skilled, Call in favor when you have found the piano that really speaks to you and you really think, this is the one that I want to buy. Call them up and have them come out and play the piano and give their thoughts on it as well, especially if they're a very skilled pianist who's done lots of concerts and played on various pianos, and because uh, they have a lot of good advice to give, and it's a really good idea to have them come out and play the piano and try the action out and give you your opinions on it. One final thing I wanted to mention, as well as the action of the piano, another thing that's variable on pianos is simply the sound of the room they're in. If you go to a showroom and they have hardwood floors or concrete floors and high ceilings, the piano is going to sound more bright and powerful than it will in your home with fuzzy carpets and lower ceilings. So that's another important thing that you want to look at as well. If you're playing a piano, also dealers like to put them up against walls. A lot of the times it's simply because they're putting all the pianos in a row and the piano just happens to be against a wall. But a lot of the times I think they like to put the concert grands against 
the wall because it makes them sound a lot more powerful. So that's something else you want to look at too. Where is the piano located in the room and how similar is the room it's located in to the room it's going in at your house? If you have a really tall ceilings and hardwood floors, you'd probably want to get it from a dealer who has tall ceilings and hardwood floors. But if you have um, fuzzy carpets and low ceilings, like I mentioned, you might want to take that into consideration when you're playing a piano and make the mental note, this might sound different in my house than it does here. Hopefully you've enjoyed this comprehensive review of various things that you'd want to look at on pianos when you're going to buy them. Um, it, I Hopefully this will be able to help you. It, it, it's very valuable information to look at and to look for, particularly the action, the sound of the piano and the hammers and all that stuff. So hopefully it's been able to help you if you've bought a piano and you know, you're looking for information, hopefully this will help. So if you liked this video, you can go check out my other content. I've got lots of piano related videos and also organ things as well, if that's your type of thing. I've got lots of piano reviews. I review all kinds of pianos. And so you can go check that out. And if you want to subscribe, please do. And if you do that, thank you very much. And I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.